Welcome to the Ringer Podcast Network. A rewatchable spinoff show on Luminary called Rewatchables 1999 is taking a little summer break, but we'll be back in the fall with more movies including Eyes Wide Shut, Never Been Kissed, and more. In the meantime, we're launching a new show on Luminary about another influential moment in 1999 called Break Stuff, the story of Woodstock 99. The pod will dive deep on the iconic music festival and how its success and failures left its mark on history. The series begins on Tuesday, July 9th, and will be coming to you every Tuesday for eight weeks. So make sure to check out Break Stuff, the story of Woodstock 99 on Luminary. to the Ringer NBA show. I'm Chris Vernon, and joining me as he does every Tuesday from the Ringer.com is Kevin O'Connor, aka Kevin O'Bomber, aka Kevin O'Concert, aka Kevin O'Climber, aka Kevin O'Candyland. In person, in yes. the flesh, together, <laughs> the mismatch is in Las Vegas for Las Vegas Summer League. We have both been here since Friday. We are recording this on a Tuesday, and today we are going to have seven names that have some significance from Summer League that has taken place so far. This has been the strangest of the Summer Leagues that I have attended because of the news that took place when we first got here. In fact, that's the number one name we are going to talk about, which is Kawhi Leonard. Everybody is at Summer League. It is very, very late, even on the West Coast, when the bombs start dropping that Kawhi Leonard is going to the Clippers and that Paul George is also going to be going. And, and like nobody had, listen, number one, you're in Las Vegas. Number two, it's very, very late. And you have to process everything that just took place. And like, nobody can believe it. Even when we were at uh, the live taping of Bill Simmons podcast, the other night, uh, Daryl Morey said when he saw it, He's looking at his phone going, oh, blank, yeah, <laughs> you know, like yeah. because it just surprised everybody with the way it all played out because you are you, you are then asked to process what this means for not only the Clippers, but what this means for the rest of the Western Conference and the rest of the league. Um, look, the Clippers, as we know, Kev, I mean, they they pulled off the incredible with this. As we now have had a few days to process it all, and you know what they gave up in order to get both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, what are we thinking about the trade? It's a necessary move. You're getting two of the best players in the league. To you know, it's the type of move for them. Like, yeah, it sucks that you gave up a lot, but you gave you didn't give it up just for Paul George. You gave it up to also get Kawhi Leonard. And for the Clippers, to me, they are the favorite in the NBA, Um, and like they're not like such a definitive favorite. Uh, that it's like Golden State Warriors again in KD or the Miami Heat. It's not like that with you know with LeBron James, but they're the favorite. They have an edge over this large group of teams that is going to compete for a championship. The margin for error is just a lot slimmer because they don't have as much star power as some of these other teams. And you are seeing a lot of people now saying it, it, within the league this philosophy, which is absolutely true, and it has led to huge returns for the teams that are trading stars. Anthony Davis, we talked about, like, what is the amount that you can give up that is goofy? Same thing with this one. (laughs) And the truth is, most people feel there is no amount. And I'm talking about people that run teams. The more you talk to the people that run teams, you know what they say? What you can't get in the NBA is the star slash superstar. That's the unattainable. Mm -hmm. You can find the other guys. The hardest thing to get is a star, somebody that's really a star. And we're not talking about a draft pick. We're not talking about maybe this could be. You know it is an established, unbelievable player in his prime. And so the cost of that has inevitably gone up. But these teams are now, you know, it used to be if you traded the star, you never got the better end of the deal. And that may change, right? Well, yeah, because we, it we, can we play saw, out. Uh, Oklahoma City, what they right. did, we saw it a couple of weeks ago when New Orleans got. Yes. Yeah. Two times in a row in a month. And like, by the way, like the funny thing is, is like New Orleans had the greatest return for a superstar ever. 
then a couple of weeks later, it's the Oklahoma City Thunder in return for Paul George. But, you know, for the Clippers, it, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. Like, you had to give that up because of the two guys that you're getting. And now they have two guys that perfectly complement each other. These two superstars who can defend at a high level, who can play on ball or off ball, who can serve as a go-to scorer or as a shooter off ball or a guy who makes the right play off the dribble. They have guys who complement each other perfectly. Unlike past teams where, you know, KD goes to the Warriors and he needs to get adjusted to the system because he's so used to being a ball dominant guy. You have LeBron James and Dwayne Wade, some of their overlapping ball dominant tendencies. These guys perfectly complement each other. And they're on top of this unbelievably impressive core with veterans and young guys. You have the Landry Shamets of the world, Jerome Robinson. Maybe he becomes a player. Montrez Harrell. And the veterans, of course, with Lou Williams, Pat Beverly, and so on. So this is like a strong, deep team that also has its star power. And that's where they get an edge over some of these other teams. There's just a lot, a lot of contenders still. And by the way, like, I was so happy that night that he went to the Clippers just because like, if he went to the Lakers, we'd have that one super team like we've talked about. And now we have a league where you can make the case for like 12 or 13, maybe 14 teams to have a shot at a title. Maybe with how their team is currently constructed – or if they add one more guy. Uh, so I'm, I'm thankful on Friday night that that was what drops. Kawhi Leonard going to the Clippers and then Paul George being traded there. It's, it's awesome. The NBA is, it's NBA is nuts, man. Because what, we have take, what has taken place is we have all of these teams now that our, our opinion of them has grown exponentially over the course of the past couple of weeks. So we have looked and we have said, well, geez, look at what Utah did. And they have to be considered a contender and then you talk about uh, portland who like you can't cut them out i mean look they were right there uh in the western conference the entire year and were the three seed last year um clippers and what they have added the lakers and what they have added i mean you are now getting down to if you just talk about both la teams utah okay so those are three teams that we have looked at this offseason and gone my god how much have they improved you still have, how about this, Kevin? If you talk about those three, if you talk about Utah and the two LA teams, you're talking about them before you even get to who the top three seeds were. I'm sorry, four seeds were <laughs> last year. Golden State, Denver, Portland, and Houston. Mm-hmm. That was the top four seeds in the Western Conference last year. And we're talking about the two LA teams in Utah before yeah. we get to any of them. It's pretty, it's pretty ridiculous. And, and, and even, and even those teams, I mean, like Golden State loses KD and Clay's out for most, maybe who knows what, maybe all the season, but Golden State adding D'Angelo Russell to yep. their core. I mean, if Clay's able to get back mid season, if by the playoffs, he's healthy, who knows? Like maybe Golden State, we're talking about them still as a contender. Well, right now they're viewed as a team that might be fighting for the playoffs when it's just Steph for the majority of the year. And they will be. I think, um, but D'Angelo Russell changes that whole dynamic. And then with Denver, I think Jeremy Grant is one of the most underrated additions of the off season. He is absolutely the perfect front court player to have next to Nik- Nikola Jokic uh, and then Jamal Murray as well in the backcourt for them. Jeremy Grant is that the versatile defensive player who can rebound, who doesn't need to touch the ball offensively, but he's a good spot up shooter who attacks closeouts and they could not have gotten a better guy for that team. So like, they got better too. <laughs> and then with Portland, like you get the Hassan Whiteside salary that maybe he helps you, but maybe he's also at that $20 million salary filler that you can use during the season to try to flip for a guy. So like those teams got better than Houston is still Houston, despite all the stuff. They still have a really, really strong team. So like <laughs> those four were, were had a shot last year, aside from the fact Golden State was Golden State. But now we're adding those two L.A. teams on top of that. It's unbelievable, man. Well, and it's really hard if you are one of those teams that really wants to win and really wants to get into the playoffs. Say you are the Sacramento Kings, and they went and spent a ton of money in this offseason. I forgot Houston added Shamori Pons. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> he had a great game in the summer league. And they are, <laughs> they are going to be, hopefully, <laughs> taking a step up. Like, let's say you're the Kings, okay? Look, Kev, if we replace OKC with the Lakers, right? That gives us Warriors, Nuggets, Blazers, Rockets, Jazz, Clippers, Spurs, Lakers. Unbelievable. How are you getting in the playoffs? Well, I mean, then after that, it's like you have these teams like (laughs) Minnesota that that are trying to make a push. Minnesota wants to win. Yep. Sacramento wants to win. The Kings want to win. Yep. 
And the, then you and have- Pel- Pelicans and, and Mavericks aren't going to be bad. Right. Not, those teams are not going to be bad. What the Pelicans did this summer is unbelievable. And then with Dallas, if Chris Tapps Porzingis is healthy and Luka Doncic makes another little a, a bit of leap, <laughs> they're going to be trying to push for that 7-8 seed. Yep. And they might not get it, but you're going to have 10, 11, 12 teams that have playoff aspirations in the Western Conference and only they're going to make it. Okay, if it's I wild. gave you Lakers, Clippers, and gave you the rest of the field, would you take it? If I, I say I'll keep the lake, would you take that bet? I'll take the Lakers and the Clippers. You get the rest of the field. Yeah, sure. I'd take the rest. You would. Yeah, I think so. You think it's? I mean, I, you I, think I mean, it's, I'm getting six teams versus two teams. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm talking about the whole league. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll take. I'll take. Oh, come the rest on. The There's league. nobody. Uh, nobody in the East. I would take 28 other teams. You would. Yo, the Lakers and the Clippers. Yeah, it's just math. <laughs> That's all. Well. <laughs> Look, the, the, the Clippers' odds are overwhelming yeah. right now. I, I, I mean, mean, they're not overwhelming. Like that's what I mean, though. Like, they're not overwhelming. Like KD going to a seventy-three win. I don't know, man. You see, they're, the- they're not. They're not like the Miami Heat with LeBron, Wade, and Chris Bosh when the league landscape was totally different. It's not. It's not. But like, it's not to that extent. George, by the way, until George's shoulder went bananas last year, and he turned into a radically different. There so, was a stretch where he had. I know. He had gotten himself into MVP conversations. He was dominating. There was a one month stretch where every game you watched, oh my God, he's the best player on the floor. He was out of his mind. If he can come back to that form and you're pairing him with Kawhi Leonard and you've got all those role players, you've got Pat Bev, you've got Lou Williams, you've got Montrez Harrell, which by the way, Montrez Harrell, guy I was with the other day, he walks into the summer league game, Clippers Grizzlies. Basketball shorts, a Darius Miles throwback, oh, and yeah. like six chains. And then my buddy said, that is the most gangster thing I have ever <laughs> seen. This dude is walking in just like a G. Six chains, Darius Miles throwback, the big basketball shorts. Miles, I mean, I love Montrez Harrell. So I love everything about Montrez Harrell. I, uh, but they got... I, I, used to, I used to love everything about Darius Miles on the court. <laughs> <laughs> He's a fun player to watch. I actually covered he, he him. For, league, I was like 10 years old when he was a rookie. And I, I, I think he... He wasn't rookie of the year, but he was like one of the best rookies in the league. I, I really liked him as a player. Love, I love, I love, I love Montrez <laughs> Harrell. First days. So anyways, now let's move on to what has taken place when oh, we talked about it. One thing yeah. though about Paul George, I don't know if this is true, but I, I don't really care. Uh, an agent told me that the Clippers are telling teams that Paul George might miss like the first month of the season. Um, that's fair. Yeah. Which seems reasonable, uh, but I guess that's what they're telling all right, so I was at a, and other teams, you know, because you know they may need more players. Guys, they might add could get more potential opportunity to open the season. That's essentially. I think I've mentioned this before, too. but this, this is true. Two things that stood out to me throughout the year when I was at games and things that I had never seen before. One of which I had mentioned a long time ago, and it's interesting now the way everything's played out. I have never seen a GM and a player talking to each other at halftime of a game. Mm-hmm. I've never seen that. And I was in a hallway where for a long time, Danny Ainge and Kyrie Irving were talking to each other. And I mentioned it and I was like, something is something is awry here Mm -hmm. when you are at halftime of a basketball game and the general manager is talking to the star player in the hallway. The other thing that happened this year that I had not seen before was a lot of teams will commandeer a hallway in the back. And so it happened to be a hallway that I was walking through to get to the media room. And I was walking there the night of the Oklahoma city game. And Paul George was laying on a table and he had one of these guys that was working on his shoulder, doing all kinds of stretches to his shoulder, massaging his shoulder, like all kinds of stuff. And you could see, I mean, he's wide. We're right there in the open, right? I went, was in the media room. I ate dinner, was talking to all manner of people. I walked out, and he was still on the table getting worked on by the guy. It was like, and I remember thinking to myself, is this the level of preparation that it is taking for him to be able to go and play a basketball game? Like something is wrong here. Yeah. That is very uncommon. I am not, you know, there's always guys in the training room, but I'm telling you, it was a long time, Kev, that he was on that table. Cause I went and when I walked back through, 
he was still getting worked on. And it was the same thing. He was laying on the table and the guy was working on his shoulder. And it just really stood out to me. And I thought, man, this guy may be more banged up than than what I think. And you know, know, his shooting numbers went down. He had surgery right when the damn season was over. Well, that's why, like with the Clippers, they're no guarantee. They're not like these other teams. Kawhi Leonard played nine games only two years ago because of a major random serious quad injury. This past season, he only played about 60 games because he had to rest that quad over the course of the whole year. And then the postseason, it's like I'm watching him like limp like an old man through the locker room. Even though on the court, he was a superhero watching him walk through the locker room. The guy's clearly hurt playing through something serious. So for the Clippers, they're going to have to continue load management for Kawhi Leonard. And from then for Paul George, if he misses the first month of the year and who knows how the shoulder injury affects his shot afterwards. Paul George had a super amazing hot streak over the beginning of the season, but he's never been that level of a guy. So those guys are unbelievable and they complement each other nicely. But George just had surgery. And Kawhi has a issue with his quad that's not going to go away. Right. So these guys, whether if they miss games or whether they get hurt in the postseason, I don't. I don't think the mar- the margin for error is so much slimmer for them than it was for some of these past favorites. They are just the favorites. That's let's, all. Let's get to the number two name on our list, and it was the aforementioned Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook. Uh, oh my! We talked about Oklahoma City not being a playoff team as we look at the teams right now with the way everything has shook out. We know. You know they're trying to they're, yeah, they're trying it, to move on. They're trying reported, to make a trade. They're, they're trying to move them, and there's it was reported Miami. Yep, was one team. It was reported Detroit, and was there one more? Uh, Detroit, Miami, Houston, 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 Houston which seems you know, so silly to me. You know that well. Daryl Morey is <laughs> about stars. stars. Yep. That's it, yep. and he gets his name involved with every star player in the league. Yeah. Um. Okay. Can you imagine Harden, Chris Paul, and Russell Westbrook? <laughs> it would be, a, well, I think it would I, be like one of the NBA 2K teams. Well, I think, like, why'd you build your team this way, dude? I think it would have to be. I think I think it would have to be a deal that would send Paul. I don't. I don't. And so, would you rather have Westbrook or Paul? I got an NBA Slack argument. Would you rather <laughs> have Westbrook or Paul? If I'm Houston, Houston, I mean, Paul's a theoretically a better fit next to Harden. Okay, but he's not a better player right now. Right, but he's theoretically a better fit. If, if I'm Oklahoma City, just I don't care about it from Houston's perspective. Oklahoma City is the team that has the player people want, and I don't think there's, it makes much sense to trade Russell Westbrook for an albatross contract with Chris Paul. Right. Um, I, yesterday we had an NBA Slack conversation about this, and, I, and my point was, if you're Oklahoma City, I think you can easily do better than that than Chris Paul because we we're all talking about how Chris Paul is this untradeable contract. Okay, so you're telling me Oklahoma City is going to trade Russell Westbrook, the face of their franchise, for an untradeable contract? It just doesn't make any sense to me. They're going to trade Russell Westbrook for a package that gets them contracts that combined to amount to make the trade happen, not the one singular contract with Chris Paul. If they make a trade, it would be like a Gordon Capella package. If it would be a Miami package with Winslow and Kelly Olenek and salary filler, easily tradable contracts or players that you want in addition to draft picks. I don't think it makes any sense for the Thunder to trade Russell Westbrook for Chris Paul. So for Houston's perspective, if they want to combine those three, their other guys, PJ Tucker, Clint Capella, Eric Gordon, maybe that's how you get a deal done. But even then still what I, what I've heard uh, is that Miami has been the team that's been by far the most aggressive in pursuing a trade here, which is interesting because Miami is hard capped. They don't have their 2021 or their 2023 first round draft pick. So on paper, uh, you would think this doesn't make sense for them because they're hard capped. It doesn't make sense for Oklahoma City because they already have those two first round draft picks. <laughs> so you don't want to make them stronger. And they also don't have as many assets to give. However, what's the difference here? It's Pat Riley. He's old. He doesn't care. He wants to win now, and he's willing to give up whatever it takes to make it happen. And that's why executives that I've talked to tend to think that if any team's going to land Russell Westbrook, it'll be Miami. And that's probably also the preferred destination for Westbrook as well. At one point when ESPN wrote about uh, like six possible <laughs> trades, I had jotted down what they had written for Miami. Like what kind of – what would a deal look yeah. like? And was it, was, it was Westbrook and Patterson, right, would go to Miami. Why Patterson? I guess just to, to <laughs> fill in, just to, 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 just to make the, mon- to make the, to make the money work. The Thunder would get Goran Dragic, <laughs> Justice Winslow, mm-hmm. Kelly Olynyk, and a 2025 first-round pick. Only a 2025 first-round pick? 
That's it. Uh, top 10 protected and then unprotected in 2026. Yeah, I, I would need more picks than that. And I, I'm like the biggest Russell Westbrook hater that I know. Yeah. I, I think Oklahoma City can do better than that. There is a, there is this odd side at least, where at least people throw think. A pick swap in there. Where, too. I, I, listen, you, and you know how I feel about the, when people complain greatly about overpaying the star level players. You and I got into it about Blake Griffin last year because I am of the mind that there is. Like, stop telling me about overpaying great players. Oh, right. Yeah, like, Blake Griffin if, conversation. If yeah, but, if you're gonna talk, <laughs> but if you're going to talk about overpaying players, because I think it's gone too far on the Westbrook contract, and I get it. He's always going to have a super high contract. He also affects winning and losing a lot more Definitely than a lot of guys. Losing. And typically, <laughs> stop. <laughs> typically, listen, your mistakes are overpaying guys that aren't good. Yeah. Your your mistakes are usually overpaying guys that aren't good, not overpaying guys that are good, right? Because at least you're overpaying somebody that brings a lot to the table and is an outstanding player. You know, when you look through teams and you say, God, if they could just get off of this contract or this contract really held them back, it's typically not some great player that you're sitting there going, geez, well, if they weren't playing with Russell Westbrook $40 million, they'd be able to have a good team. Like, that's probably not the problem yeah, as to why you don't have a good team. It's possible, but he is still a force of nature in the league. This yeah. guy has averaged a triple-double, for goodness sakes. I get it, right? You can focus on is what he, he gonna, can't is he do. Is he going to go to a new place and is he going to have a big man that's going to let him get all those rebounds? Those I don't four, know. Those four or five a game. Is anybody going to be as nice as Steven Adams? Maybe not. What a sweet guy to let Russell Westbrook get his triple-double. Yeah, how real nice, sweet. I mean, how, nice is, we- uh, let, how let, nice is that? Of him? Make no mistake. Russell Westbrook. You want turn- Here you go. Just, Look, just take it. Hey, you want to talk about overpaying? We can. Russell, who are we going to talk about? Well, let's talk about Stephen Adams. You want yeah, to? Yeah, sure, yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Look, Russell Westbrook got Stephen Adams $100 million. So, good thing he got out of the way. Mm-hmm. It's the only reason he's making a, a bucket load of money and is because he played with Russell well, Westbrook. And, and, so, I don't want to hear about well, it. Well, and that's the thing. Like Russell, like, I am a Russell Westbrook hater. I think he's a losing overall star player. Uh, I, like, I said he's right now after John Wall being hurt. Russell Westbrook is now the worst elite point guard in the NBA. But he's still an elite point guard. Oh, it's fooey. Dude, he's still, he's still an elite point guard. He's just the worst elite point guard in the NBA. Stop. And, <laughs> that is ridiculous. Yes. That is ridiculous. Dude, okay, so here's the thing. For years, ever since the second article I ever wrote on The Ringer was about the Russell Westbrook roadmap. Like, how can he take, take his game to the next level and therefore his team to the next level? It's improving as a spot up shooter, it's becoming a more active off ball player, cutting, screening becoming a more active, engaged defender, which he does sometimes. The off-ball stuff has not changed. The shooting has not gotten better. And the shooting, maybe it won't. Look, some guys just don't get better. They, they, they're cap, they have a ceiling. Maybe he has a ceiling. But the off-ball stuff has not changed. And so for Russell Westbrook, it would have to change if you're playing alongside Jimmy Butler in Miami. It has to change because uh, that's also a guy that has some of those weaknesses where well, let's he's, go. A, he's an all-ball dominant star. So let's for, go ahead. But, but, wait, but for Westbrook, though, Chris, like – I'm saying all that is like his criticism for years of criticism criticized him, but he's still a star level player. And I feel like in the conversation here, he's been a bit underrated. I think it is just outrageous to even s- suggest that for Oklahoma city, it makes sense to trade him for Chris Paul. It just doesn't not make sense for them. Here's what I know, Kev. I know that he has had uh, that Jimmy Butler would be well served to be playing with Westbrook because as much as everybody pops Westbrook, Durant won an MVP playing next to Westbrook. Paul George was just out of his mind until the shoulder thing. Stephen Adams got hundred million dollars. Stephen Adams got. I mean, it. He has made players. He has played with great players. He has enabled them to have outstanding seasons. Even Jeremy he, Grant, who we talked about earlier. Yes. The, the, even with him, it's like he was somebody that was able to play off of Russell Westbrook because he's somebody that doesn't need to control the ball. He can cut play defense and all that. Like he compliments Russ, Russell Westbrook perfectly. He attracts so much attention. He <laughs> demands so much attention that when he drives to the basket, if you can knock down shots, you are going to get a lot of great looks playing with him. Um, and so it would be interesting because of what we have seen with him playing with Durant, what we have seen playing with Paul George. What if Jimmy <laughs> Butler is the third? And here's the thing. Those guys are both absolute dogs. 
I would love. I would love. I would love to see them. Be like both Spider Spider Man meme in the like Eastern Conference. Yes, Until I'd love I, to see them both in the Eastern Conference on a team, and somebody have to face them. Them going up against like a Philly, or them going up against a Milwaukee. You know, when it comes yeah. playoff time, I think Miami. That's by far the most fun destination. It's also hard to see how it gets there, given what Miami has to give up. Maybe you can get a third team involved. In order to facilitate it, who knows? Um, but let's move on to. Well, well one second yeah. though. I think with OKC, the one name we haven't mentioned yet. To, like you mentioned all they gave up, all the first round draft picks, but they also giving up Shea Gilgis Alexander, that's right. one of the best young point guards in the league, and that's why trading Russell Westbrook is something that they have to do. Um, but I think Gilgis Alexander is the worst of the great young point guards. I'm <laughs> I'm just messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> with Gilgis Alexander, like he's already a really good defender. Yep. And he is already like a smart pick and roll playmaker. And those are two things you can very rarely say for a 20 year old player, for any player at any position, but especially point guards. And he's already good at those two things. And he got uh, steadily better over the course of the year on the offensive end of the floor. His shot's gotten better. So for him, it's like, that's the guy you're going to invest in now if you're Oklahoma City. And I, I just don't think it makes sense to keep Russell Westbrook around. you got to trade him for what you can, whether it's now or sometime during the season. And bringing in another point guard like Chris Paul, who is going to demand having the ball in his hands, I think that hurts Gildas Alexander's development. So like, if you're trading him, it has to be a Drogic type, a guy who's an expiring contract. Detroit, a Reggie Jackson type, an expiring contract, a guy who cares, cut his ass if he's going to become a problem. Like That's the type of player, because you're investing in Shea Gildas Alexander here. That's the player you're investing in, not anybody else. If you're investing in Chris Paul, you need to play that guy for as long as you have him. And you're going to have him for a long time, because we just had the conversation around, you know, and yep. we as an NBA collective NBA Twitter about how this guy is an untradeable contract. So they're not going to trade for it. It does not make sense. And if they do, if OKC does, it's a mistake. They can do better than Chris Paul, which is fascinating to say, because he's so, uh, he's he was a star player just yeah. entering right. last season. That's right. And now, you know, he's, he's lost a step. Defense is not quite the same. Still really good. Still really, really, Still really good. good. Still really good, but not the guy who makes sense right. for OKC. Um, the Gilgis Alexander thing is, I like you bringing him up because Summer League makes me think about guys from last year and then guys from this year. And I'm just going to do this as a quick aside. When I was writing the article for The Ringer about uh, players Your that— incredible brain. Yeah, right. The, uh, <laughs> the, the draft guys that won't fail, I— <laughs> Several years now, two, three years in a row, when I have talked to people that really know that Kentucky program, Mm -hmm. they were really high last year on Knox and not so high on Gilgis Alexander. And you know who the one this year is that they weren't that high on. And I'm talking about fans of that program, people that cover that program. When I say, hey, who who's really worth banking on? And it was Knox that they were telling me last year. <laughs> this year, not high at all when I was trying to get feedback on what they thought. Because they watched every game. They were covering that team. They weren't that high on Keldon Johnson. They said he was very underwhelming. Whatever. And I'm telling you, saw him in the Utah Summer League, and I've seen him some here. He looks way better than he did when he was playing well, Kentucky. I mean, and, we might have. I got worried that there might be a little uh, Devin Booker action going on with Keldon Johnson. I'm like, this guy looks good. Anytime the Spurs draft a guy, I was like, I know, I was wrong on that guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like as soon as they make that thing, I was like, oh, where do I have Keldon Johnson ranked? Thirty seventh. Oh, too low. I made a mistake. Yeah, let, <laughs> and I, like, and like, just like another quick aside on Keldon Johnson. It's like the, the the flaw with him really is that like he's just sort of. You know, he's like robotic in some ways. Like, I think I had a word for, I called him robotic in the draft guide. It's like his passing is sort of robotic. He's, his, 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 he doesn't have the best ball handling it ability. Feels he's deliberate. Like, yeah, he's just sort of like a straight line driver guy, very decisive with his decisions. And that's sort of what San Antonio likes a guy who is decisive and, ma- and makes those reads, you know, as a scorer. So he plays hard. Yep. Like those are two positive qualities. Gets he, in passing lanes, active. He, he's a solid three point shooter as well. So it's like for San Antonio, you're maybe you're not drafting him to be a star. You're drafting him to be a really good role player. And that's where he projects as. And, and that's with San Antonio. It's like, well, maybe he becomes a role player and then he makes that next leap yep. where 
in that system, he you know, developed some of those things that he showed more in high school. It let's doesn't get, show in college. Let's get to our third name, which is Zion Williamson. Zion! It, it was not... What a night. It was disappointing that Zion Williamson, who... I mean, hell, it feels like half the first round, if not more, the whole first round is basically sitting this out for oh summer. League. We're not seeing Unreal. a ton of players playing in this um, as compared to years in the past. But we were going to get on, to on see. On the TV, we have the Duke-Gonzaga game playing for some reason. From last year. <laughs> They're showing yeah. the top 20 games of last year uh, on some channel that's on the, the TV here. Um, ESPN year. <laughs> Zion Williamson. Is that what it is? Yeah. Zion Williamson. Uh, cool we only that. got to see him one night for a short amount of time. And, and then as a precautionary measure with so Pelican say is nothing serious at all. <laughs> a precautionary measure is it's a fake injury. <laughs> yeah. He was not going to play anymore. <laughs> I'll tell you this, Kev. It's the first time I've been in an arena. This is the first load management in summer league ever. Probably. Yeah. First time I've ever been in an arena uh, where Zion Williamson was playing. I had not seen him yet. I was not uh, Kevin O'Cameron crazy oh, dude, earlier so this year. I know it was. Um, I was kind of I was kind of like bringing it. Number one, he's absolutely huge in person oh. where you see him. I mean, I was, I was next to the like, tunnel. And you see him on TV and you think like, my God, that guy, you know, he looks huge. And then to see him in person. And just the size of this guy, he, he's just a mammoth. And, and so I was there in the tunnel when he was walking out. And when they were going through their layup line, the buzz in that crowd, it was Steph even Curry-like. at Summer League, was just crazy. I mean, roars every time he would do something. And then he went and in the layup line just did a layup Ooh. and everybody started booing. Dude, I mean, I was it, like, this it, is crazy. Only time I can ever recall something like that is Steph Curry's warmups. Yep. That's the only time that I can remember. And there's probably other times that I'm forgetting. I have a poor memory. That's forgive me. But <laughs> like Steph Curry is the most you, recent time. The biggest one I've ever seen in my life uh, was, I mean, it's many, many years ago. It's whatever, 10, 15 years ago. And it was at the very height of now. Now, when Jordan came with the Wizards, it was huge, no yeah, doubt oh, about yeah, it, yeah, right? No doubt. But certain LeBron years. In too. terms of like roar, pandemonium, <clears throat> it felt like a rock star just walked in. There was always the Kobe Shaq one, and I yeah, would put yeah, that yeah. one up very high. Yep. Nothing compared to Iverson. Nothing. It was like, I mean, it was like something like like some kind of like uh, like Justin Bieber walked in or something. I mean, people, it was Justin Bieber. I, you know, I'm just you saying, like you know, Justin Bieber. no, like you know, like when you see those, like uh, you know, at the height of his stardom, yeah, yeah. when you'd see those things, and he like he would like walk out on the balcony in are London you're, you're, or something. And there's Be- like, are you a Bieber fan? I'm a believer. Okay. Really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he would like walk out on the balcony. Right. And there'd be like these throngs of people. They're all just yeah. going absolutely crazy just because they're seeing him. <laughs> That's how it felt. Is, with is Justin Bieber, the greatest Canadian artist of all time. Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, no, unfortunately you think about Nickelback when you it, it, think of Drake, Drake, Drake Rush, Rush. Yeah. Is, you seem like a Rush guy. Yeah. I like Rush. I could see you blaring Tom Sawyer in your headphones. I, I, I like Rush. Today's I, Tom Sawyer, I, mean, mean, right. <laughs> I don't think I'm like, Do you like, no, his mind is not for rent. The put him down is arrogant. Yes. You like it? Yes. It's, it's very good. Yeah. Very good job. Shout out! Yeah, Neil, you, do you work on that? Shout out to Neil Park. Do you work That's on that? Drummer. That's her drummer. Does do you work on that? I'm Giddy Lee. Oh my god! No. Does Arcade Fire count as a Canadian band? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if they do. Celine Dion does because oh, they they have some people from Canada in there. But Win Butler. Leads Shout to out to Celine from, Dion. From Texas lives in New Orleans now. That, let's call Arcade Fire a Canadian band. You want to do that? Yeah, that, yeah. They're my they're my all time favorite Canadian artist. Number four, <laughs> a player that is not playing. Oh. <laughs> And uh, we, we got to mention dude, there Zion. Was an earthquake that night. There was a freaking earthquake. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, well, one thing we need to talk about Zion's game. Zion. Oh like, yeah. Zion, <laughs> Zion had a good game. Why did uh, Kevin Knox not retire after that? Oh, when he stripped the ball. Okay, that, you just, that, that, is, that, is, that is, you are a child. Give me that ball, well, bitch. He no, just no. yanked it away from him and dunked, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself. That that game, we only saw Zion for nine minutes. Yep. We saw. The full scope 
Except for the transition offense aspects. <laughs> well, you did um, see him yeah. pull up. But, and they were like, and Zion Williamson's going to try to show off more parts of his game. I love when they're always talking oh, about they, these they guys trying the to show broadcast. more parts oh, of his game. That. He doesn't have that part of that of his game. Bro, he it's, pulled it's very, up for a jumper, and it was wind. Well, that's the thing with Zion. Like he, <laughs> His fan almost got a souvenir. <laughs> and that's the thing. His jumper is not good, and that's going to be a problem for him as a rookie. Yep. He needs to develop that over time. We saw that off the dribble. He's a non-factor from shooting. Shooting off the dribble is a non-factor. And then spotting up, he's Mitchell Robinson sagging off him, like, shoot it, shoot it, shoot it, because he, he's not a threat yet. Um, and defense is going to do that all year. But what we did see was the dunking, the pick and roll. Uh, yes. he, had, he had three finishes. Uh, rolling out of the pick and roll in that in that first quarter alone, when he only had seven all year in college, so already three and and nine minutes in summer league action. Um, that's going to be a huge factor for him as a rookie. We didn't see the passing as much, yeah. but he he can do that as well. And I thought the most impressive play was the one you mentioned. Where he ripped the ball out of Kevin Knox's hands. Yeah, anybody can look this up. Uh, the the videos everywhere. Just type in Zion Williams and Kevin Knox. Yeah. You don't know what we're talking about, but yeah. it was insane. It was great. And the reason, one reason why it was so great for me is because Zion got off to a poor start in the yep. game. He did not do anything early in the game, but still he continued playing aggressive defense. He continued staying locked in. Sometimes when things don't go well for certain players, they just kind of just get lazy yep. or they, they try to do too much as a player. Zion perfectly read that play and, and got there at the right moment to rip the ball out of his hands. It was just an aggressive moment that sort of activated him. Like then, and then from there, the rest of the first quarter, he was awesome. Uh, so for Zion, like that, that's one thing he does have that a lot of guys don't is just that real intense will to win. And so that, that's going to carry him through some of those struggles he has as a shooter because he can do so much already on the floor. I wanted to run on the court like it was the Rucker. You know awesome. what I mean? Yeah. He snatched the ball was, out of that. Hey, give me, I was cheering. Give I, me that freaking ball. I, I don't really care. Like I and was, then he, I was and then he I, I was having hey, a good time. Then he dunked and started flexing. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, was oh awesome, my dude. God, yeah. what a man. I, I, what a I was, friggin' man. I, I, was, I was sitting there cheering. I don't care if I'm in media. Row. It was a great time. So it's unbelievable. Fun, dude, the atmosphere then, that, it's a shame they didn't play nine minutes. The atmosphere is unbelievable. Okay. Then, the, then the earthquake happens. <laughs> okay. So look, after about uh, right into the second half, I end up going back. We had had a long, long day of travel. We're going to go catch the rest of it back at the hotel. And me and my uh, producer for my local show, John Roser, and Jaron Jackson Sr. Mm -hmm. um, had met up, and we were – because they were all leaving at the same time or staying at the same hotel. We go and – all starving. We've been on the same flights all day and we go to I'm hungry right now. the sports book. <laughs> we go to the sports book and grab some pizza. Okay. Yeah, so we're sitting there eating really pizza. pizza. I am sitting on a bar stool and what, what kind of pizza? It is just cheese pizza. <laughs> and it starts wobbling around. And I'm like, yo, are y'all's bar stools wobbling? <laughs> and and like I see like there's like a this wall of beads up on like that's hanging from 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 the top of the ceiling and it's like swaying back and forth and i'm feeling like everything is off and all of a sudden uh jaron jackson who has been uh played in la he's like that's an earthquake i've been through one of these before and i was like wait what and he's like it's an earthquake and i'm talking stuff is just like rattling around i i had never felt an earthquake before and that what you want to talk about uh, troubling. I mean, I'm feeling it. I don't you, you're so like out of control and I don't know what's happening, but everything just feels like it's moving at this time. And I've never I've never been through one before. Obviously, now I'm an earthquake survivor. Um, <laughs> Come on. Crazy. No, I survived it. <laughs> Listen, you don't have to Dude, get- earthquakes are serious business. I'm not, a- I'm not I'm not asking you to call me brave, but I'm kind of asking for you to call me brave. I mean, so- I really I was I, I was brave in that moment. Actually, I was freaking out. I didn't know what the hell was Were going on. Were you really out. freaking out? Yes. Like what is happening and why is my chair moving and what like is, am I going to am I going to die? Like I don't even I don't know. I don't know anything about an earthquake. I don't know what's happening. I know that the ground under my feet feels like it's moving, and this is extremely troubling. But, you know, in true uh, brave uh, fashion, so, I, I fought it oh off. Boy. A- after um, off. the earthquake on the 4th of July, I was in L.A. for that one. Yeah. Um, I started listening to a podcast called the, called the Big One, Your Survival Guide. 
and it's it's for for like preparing for the big one in LA or in anywhere in California. You're and listening the, to a name. podcast about surviving is, an earthquake. This is on the Fourth of July. I'm listening to the podcast. So on the Fourth of July, I didn't really do anything. I went to go see John Wick three um, by myself. I went up to eat by myself at the Century uh, City Mall. <laughs> uh, Say and, something else pathetic. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Um, <laughs> and, then, and, and, and I also listened to uh, the big one, your survival guide, by myself. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, <laughs> on, I mean, on the 4th of July. That is three um, for three. Yeah, and <laughs> Can somebody at the ringer <laughs> invite him to do something? Know, Damn. That would have been great. God that bless. Nice. That is that unbelievable. Nice. It's a 4th yeah. of July. Call my yeah. man Kev. That would have been good. Yeah, my, my non-ringer friends were out of L.A. Um, so I'd, <laughs> and your ringer friends yeah. just did that. Um, yeah, I, I did have one thing I could have went to. I just wasn't feeling it. So I decided just to – I wanted to see John Wick 3, to be honest right, with you. But, so let's but just anyway, the point, the point is, point is, is like earthquakes are serious business. And like it's right – you are right to be scared. Like what we felt here – and I, for what it's worth – the one on Friday night in, in Vegas, I didn't even really feel it until the end. I was walking out of the arena like I, I had my, my backpack. I was getting ready to go back to my hotel to go record. And so I'm like hustling out to get that done as soon as possible, try to beat the crowd. Um, and as I'm walking out, I see Mark Fischel, who works for the NBA. And I say, you know, have a good night, Mark. And he's like, Kevin, stop. And I was like, why? And so I stopped. I like, he's like, there's an earthquake happening. And I stopped. And like, I felt like the lasting rumbles of it. Um, so I didn't feel the whole thing. I wasn't in the arena with the, with the, right. with the Jumbotron swaying or whatever. I didn't see any of that uh, until afterwards when I saw the video. But I, at the end, I was like, oh, my God, another one happened. I was like, and I, I said, how powerful is this? And we didn't know at the moment yet, um, but quickly found out it was a, a, a 7.1. Seven, and, uh, seven and, and then were you running around everybody saying, everybody, I've been listening to a podcast, yeah. <laughs> and here's what you do. Yeah, I, I – <laughs> Tip number one. Yeah, yeah. All right. I've been listening to a podcast about what to do with this. Exa- yeah. It just so happens. I, I think the most important thing I learned from that podcast <laughs> is like to have it to like underneath your bed, having like shoes ready, like having, having your, your, your stuff ready, your, your water, having lots of water, having all this type of stuff ready to go. Cause if you don't have shoes, glass can break and all that. Is this and, like, is, no, wait, listen, is this podcast hey, done by an expert? I'm yes. not going to tell you this shit. You should listen to Hey, it. have your shoes ready. No, it, it, it yeah, like, because it has glass shatters so often. And the most common injury people had in past earthquakes is people coming to the hospital with a bunch of little pieces of glass in their feet. Because they didn't have shoes on in their house. Yeah, yeah, that's simply the reason why. So it's like being ready, like instead of like walking around and all that, like just like don't run outside or anything like that. Just be ready. So do you just yeah. have to do you just have to sit around having, with having, your house? Have, do you always having, have your... having like a pack ready? Like especially if you live in LA. Do you have an earthquake pack? No, I don't. But I'm gonna get one. So it's just like <laughs> what's a, in know, it? I don't know, like dude. I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Jerky. <laughs> you have plenty of water. Stuff that stuff yeah. that keeps. <laughs> it's um yeah it's it's pretty just listen to the podcast. I'm are not, you are you? I'm not explaining it well. I only listen to like the first one. Do you sit um, around in your shoes in the house now? No, I don't. No, you don't. I, okay. I, I, just in I, case. LA streets are dirty, man. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get in the habit of taking off my my sneakers every time I get in the house. Um, they're dirty, dude. All right, let's get to the, let's get to the rest of these names because we got to bust through these. Number four, yeah. Michael Porter Jr. Upon arrival, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, the night, we're, we're really forty the, minutes. <laughs> the, no, the night before the night before summer league start, it comes out that Michael Porter Jr. Has injured himself and is not going to be available for summer league. Boy, he was, sucks. no lie, the second most intriguing player that I thought I was going to get to see here, yeah. uh, because he is such an unknown. Um, we have not gotten to see him play real competitive basketball in so long. He was a shell of himself when he did. Uh, during the SEC tournament and the NCAA tournament, uh, uh, by uh, by all accounts, um, when you talk to people, that was a very poor representation of what he is. And so, don't. That's the only time I've seen him. Don't judge him on that. And then you have to go back to the high school tapes, which are absolutely incredible. I have had more than a few people tell me that he is one of the absolute greatest college prospects they have ever seen when they saw him in high school. Um, that. What we saw at Missouri when he played at the very end was not a good representation of what kind of player he is. And so this was going to be the stage, and we were going to get to see him 
uh, live and in person, and that was taken away from not only him, but also all of us that were so excited to get to see him play for the first time. So the most intriguing guy, this guy that, you know, if if it all goes a little bit differently, might have been a number one to number five pick in the draft, but he's taken towards the end of the lottery. Instead, he's stowed away by a team that was already a great team last year. The wait continues, Kev. So we, uh, uh, we I, I, I will still look forward to getting to see Michael Porter Jr. play basketball. It's um, it's scary. I heard the injury happen towards the end of practice, maybe even the last player practice. Um, so for him, like I can't imagine <clears throat> how painful this is. Yep. Because think about also his family history. Yep. Of injury, his brother tore his ACL twice. His sister tore her ACL five times. Her other, his other sister needed like knee reconstruction. Um, but I think more people in the family had injuries as well. Like this is a injury prone family. Yep. <laughs> uh, why? Like people say it's because they're vegan. I have no idea. I no don't know why. I don't, I don't think that's why. They just might be genetically injury prone. So for Michael Porter, it's like you want to be the one guy who at least stays healthy <laughs> when you might be the most talented one of any of them. And it's a shame if he's not able to stay healthy um, with the back problem he has. And what's that foot issue? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. It's some type of foot thing because of the back. The back and, is what scares you. I know, but now the right because he's a six eleven guy with a with a, with a rough but, back. But now with a knee problem as well, um, it's scary because this is a guy who, like I just mentioned earlier, our Jeremy Grant is perfect for yeah. that Denver team. Well, so was Michael Porter with his size at six foot ten with his scoring ability. That's, that's exactly what they need. Is like as another guy alongside Jokic and Jamal Murray, he's the guy who could become that third star alongside those two. And if he's not able to stay healthy, obviously he can't. But it would be a shame if we're not able to see him on the court um, for an extended period of time for him. Like any other rookie, he has a learning curve. Um, and hopefully we're able to get that at some point during preseason. I look forward to seeing him because yep. what we saw at Missouri, like you said, was not a representation of what he was as a high school prospect. My question is, is the Missouri representation just more accurate? Okay. Like is he, can, can he be the same guy that he was in high school? More fluid without the, the, the medical problems that he's had. All right, Kevin, we'll get right back to it. I want to remind everybody that today's episode of The Mismatch is brought to you by Express. I love wearing jeans. Who doesn't love wearing jeans? They're comfortable. They look good. They allow you to move. And if you live in your jeans, comfort and fit are important. And Express Hyper Stretch Jeans are designed with the highest level of stretch for maximum comfort so you can make moves all day long. Plus, with more sizes and styles than ever before, Express Jeans have the perfect pair for you. Everybody wears jeans, but no two people wear them exactly the same way. Find what fits your ambition, your style, and your life. Find what fits you right now. Express is offering our listeners an exclusive limited time offer in stores or online. Get $20 off any one pair of Express jeans when you use the promo code 9994 at checkout in store or at express.com. That's express.com or head to a store and use the promo code 9994 at checkout and you will receive $20 off any one pair of jeans. Exclusions apply. Today's mismatch is also brought to you by Google Fi. Doesn't it feel like most phone plans just weren't made for us in mind? Between bad coverage, paying too much for data that you don't actually use, and crazy roaming charges, Google Fi is a phone plan by Google made with features that people like you and I actually want. Features like free international roaming, so you never have to worry about calling up your provider to let them know you're going to be traveling, and three networks in one, so you stay connected wherever you are, your home to your office, and everywhere in between. Google Fi works on your favorite smartphone, so you don't have to switch phones just to switch plans. In fact, it's just as easy as downloading an app, and you only have to pay for the data that you use. Plus, with bill protection, if you ever use a lot of data, your bill is capped at a reasonable amount. Learn more at fi.google.com. That's fi.google.com. Switch to Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. Number five, a couple of big name point guards that were taken in the draft that are playing in this. And these are RJ Barrett and Kobe White uh, fr- uh, from North Carolina. Uh, I mean, I'm intrigued by you calling them point guards. Well, I'm just intrigued. What do you think they're going to do? I don't, know. I don't I mean, they're going to have the ball in their hands, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, primary ball handler, playmaker you, types. Yeah. You would imagine so. Yeah. Um, I'm torn on the RJ stuff. He's 
clearly looked really bad. Yep. Okay. But there are times where I've seen somebody in summer league and I have seen them be great. And we've come on here and we have talked about them. Uh, most famously two years ago, Donovan Mitchell, I'd seen him in person. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I watched a game where he had eight steals in the game. He was just, it looked like they had taken a five time NBA all-star and thrown him in a summer league game. He was so much better than everybody else on the court. And it was obvious then. So sometimes you can have these elite level performances and it is a sign of things to come. There are other times where you can be terrible and it doesn't mean anything or times right? that you're unbelievable. and It doesn't mean anything either. Right. So that's the thing. It's so hard to gauge now because in the past couple of years, there have been two times uh, specifically that I can remember where I was at a game. I watched a guy and I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, one of wh-, and I was I was dead wrong to put any stock into it in retrospect. One of them was. I watched a game where a kid was like one for 11 and 0 for nine from three, I think. And that was marketing. And he, I mean, he looked terrible. Mm-hmm. He looked terrible in the game. He missed every, Trey Young looked missed every shot. Horrible. And Trey Young Awful. last year. So that is two. And so there's many, many more Stanley Johnson had course, an unbelievable summer league. And right. he has not been an unbelievable player. Oh, there's been tons yeah. of these over there's, the it's years. Endless. It's every yes. single year. And every yet, year. yet we continue to be like, Oh, RJ Barrett's going to be bust because he sucks in summer league. It's like, yeah. So what? So what? Is it so what? Is it so it is okay. so what? I mean, there are other times where a guy sucks and it is like, oh, well, maybe he just sucks. <laughs> it, it, <it's laughs> that's like, a, that's the hard part about this. Sometimes it sometimes it has meaning and sometimes it doesn't. And that's how you have to delineate. I will say this about when you see white in person, big, and also in, in addition to size, I mean, he's a quick guy that can really get in the lane. And but he has not had shot the ball well. He has not shot the ball well. I mean, and, and he throws the ball. I mean, he, yep. he can he can get he can force your defense. He can get your defense in scramble mode, and he could toss it up to Daniel Gafford, who's just finishing yep. it for thunderous dunks. His passing's been good. Yes, that's been the impressive part. Yes, I, uh, like the shooting has not been there, and I do I do have concern about his shot off the dribble, like because the low release. Um, but there's no doubt, man. The passing looks good. He looks yeah. like a guy who could be a primary for you. And on RJ, who you were very high on, you have no level of concern that he has looked terrible. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, his weaknesses are his weaknesses. Then that's what's, that what we're seeing right now. The ball handling ability, how great is his first step getting by the defender, um, getting to the rim, the sort of ground-bound athleticism where he just barrels into people. We're seeing that as a concern as well. His jumper has not been great. That's also a concern. Like these, there's legitimate concerns about RJ Barrett. And if you're expecting him to come in as a rookie player and be a super productive player, you're you're going to be wrong. You're going to be disappointed. RJ's a guy that you're. He's a long term investment. Yeah. That you're banking on the size and the athleticism and the playmaking that he's shown and the potential scoring ability if his shot continues to improve. And maybe it will not. Maybe he just has average touch which a uh, strong pop probability that he is just going to be an average shooter. Um, but I think you're betting on his competitiveness and his character um, and, and how much he loves the game of basketball to improve as a defender, to reach his potential there. And to also just find the right balance of finding scoring and playmaking because he can play make, but sometimes he gets tunnel vision. So finding the balance there and that doesn't happen overnight. It's not going to happen now in summer league. It's something that happens over the years. So no, I'm not going to overreact to a couple poor summer league performances now. Okay, number six. Uh, and I mentioned that there are some times where you will go to games and the there is a player that is out on the court that just looks so much better than everybody else that is on the court. And that has happened multiple times with second-year player for the San Antonio Spurs, Lonnie Walker. Um, God, the, the, the night of the earthquake – he in a game that got called short. He had 28 <laughs> points in 23 minutes, and then uh, yesterday he had 32 points. And if you watch the game, it just looks like this guy is better than everybody else. Now, second year players that are playing in this, which there aren't a ton, typically feel much more comfortable in the setting. They it slows down for them. Uh, you know, these games are going a hundred miles an hour in many cases. And so it kind of slows down to them. They've got a confidence about the way they play and what they're trying to do. Um, but my reaction as I was watching him was, oh man, the Spurs got another one because he, he looks like he has a chance to be extremely good in the NBA. Yeah. With Lonnie Walker, 
the shooting off the dribble, the yep. go-to scoring ability. He he looks like he's coming a long, long way in a short amount of time. Um, uh, you look like with him, there's going to be a learning curve, of course. Still a young player, um, but he's showing some of the flashes that he showed in college, um, being more than like a three and D type of guy, but being that go-to scoring type because he's an elite athlete. Um, and his ball handling is a shifty guard, a shifty wing. Uh, but like there's certain flaws that he had in college, like the vision, the pat, the feel, um, things like that. But the ability was all there. And we're starting to see that. I think after a year of working with Chip England as well, his shot looks a bit better, a bit smoother. So for him, it's like, hmm. Does he have star potential? Is there a star lane here from Chris? If you see him in if if his summer league performances are indicative of not all of it translating because the competition level is obviously nowhere close to what you are seeing on a nightly basis for 20 years old. I would tell you this. If Lonnie Walker became a star player in the NBA, it would not surprise me. See, he does some really special stuff and he is a mega athlete. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) there were a couple drives where, I mean, this guy is cocking it back. Like, uh, like, like slam uh, dunk contest dunks. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he can really get above the rim. And so when you find guys with that kind of athleticism that can also knock down shots, you've got the components. You've got the components to be able to be, you know, if you're a smart player that's like a crazy athlete who can also shoot, yeah, you've got a chance at being a star. Yeah, yeah the, the, the go-to scoring ability is, is is the ticket for him. Yep. You know, I didn't love him in the draft. I had him ranked 13th or 14th, you know, late lottery guy. And well, we went 18. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that was fair. I think it was fair for a ranking. Um, you know, with him, he has, he, like for him, he had good touch yep. in, co- in college. The, shooter, the percentages were not great, um, but he shot the ball well from three in a limited sample last season with San Antonio. He didn't do any much else well on the offensive end of the floor. Um, but he looks to be a guy that's going to get more opportunity this year. And maybe after DeRozan is gone at some point, then Lonnie Walker will be ready to step into an elevated role. Um, but yeah, he, he looks, he looks unbelievable, yep. man. And we'll, we'll see how he develops. Cause he, he wasn't great last year. Yep. Um, in limited opportunity, but, um, all right. Well, he only played 17 games. Number seven, you have a hell of a impression made by Jackson Hayes. Jackson Hayes. And I, this is not hyperbole or being prisoner of the moment. That was one of the greatest dunks I've seen. It was unbelievable. The dunk that became incredibly viral. And it shows what kind of an athlete this guy is. And when you are talking about Zion Williamson in the mix on this team and this kid, holy mackerel. Um, you, 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 this is going to be, uh, the run for the hills or end up on a poster team because between him and Zion and their ability to elevate and what they are going to do to people that try to get in their way and stop them from dunking. I mean, you got two guys that can jump over people and it wasn't just that. I mean, he's, he's got 28 points in the game. He blocks some shots. He's very active and he is a fascinating prospect to say the least. Cause you know, as the story yeah. goes, he was a football kid, uh, who grew up playing football and then hit this huge growth spurt. And so he wasn't somebody that was on the national radar since he was 13 or 14, like many of his peers, right? It was later that he kind of jumped onto the scene and became somebody that was coveted in recruiting circles. Uh, And so it came to him later. It is not totally – it's it's a little reminiscent of – and I don't want to say this, uh, listen, he's nowhere near the prospect the kid is. But story-wise, it, it reminds me when I hear about it of, of Davis, right, who was a guard, Anthony Davis, who was a guy that was always like, you know, a smaller guard. And then he hit this massive growth spurt. And then it's like, oh, my God, like if he keeps the skills that he has had, he was an afterthought as a perimeter guy. And then when he sprouts up to become this 6'11 mega athlete, it's now, oh my goodness, if all of this stuff can be refined, you have this insanely special player. And there are certainly moments where you see Hayes and you go, boy, there is really, really something there. When you are that size and that agile and with the ability to jump like that, if you can learn 
the game, right? And play a, a role within the game and find out what you are best at doing, which uh, at least he's already really good at doing one thing. We know that. It, um, it's like you said, he's agile too. He's yep. not just a leaper. He's yep. agile. He's coordinated. And the skill that really does carry over from football, he's a wide receiver, is the hands. He has really good hands. He can catch the low passes, high passes. doesn't matter where you throw it. He's going to get the ball, and he's not going to he's not going to double clutch the ball either. He's somebody who is a coordinated player who can fluidly transition from a dribble or from a, like get, catching a lob and dunking the ball or laying it up uh, with good touch as well. So I think for him, he's not just going to be a dunker. He's a guy going to be a guy who can hit those shots near the rim within a couple feet of the rim. O- over time, like you mentioned, AD in the sense that it's like a guy who had a growth spurt. Like he's not AD. He's he's not going right. to become AD, but maybe he can become. Over time, like a, I mean, we had, we compared him to Clint Capella in the draft guide. I think he'd be better than Capella. Um, Capella was somebody when he came into the, into the league, he was not as fluid. Like I, I, I Capella was like ball handling wasn't great. His decision making was not great. Slow to read the floor, and Hayes has some of those flaws as well. But he's more fluid and he has better hands. Um, and for him, uh, oh, I'm I'm going to be most curious to see how does he defend as a rookie, um, because he obviously is athletic. He plays hard, and he's going to be somebody who it works hard over the course of the season too. So, how does he get better over time at reading the floor? That that to me is going to be the most interesting development to monitor for him because there's no doubt about the rim running, as you said. Where does his defense start, and where does it end the season? I, I, for me, that's going to be the most exciting thing to watch with this dude. Like we didn't see Zion, but Hayes and Nikhil Alexander Walker in my Ringer article. By the way, yes, and you're, cause, because of your incredible brain, he's the first guy on your list as well. He was, and he looked awesome in yesterday's game. I did not see it live, but I did see the highlights. And um, dude, his, all the positives that he had in college, decision making, reading the floor, versatility as a playmaker, as a as a secondary scorer, you know? both hands too. Yep. He can shoot with both hands. Yeah, he, yeah, like I mean, he is just a yes. mega talent. He is so skilled. He can shoot with the right hand and the wrong hand. Uh, sorry, I couldn't, I, I couldn't resist. There's no, no reason to throw that in there. But if you watch that him, excusable. he can finish with both. <laughs> oh, and yeah. He can finish with both and he passes with oh, both of his hands. Yeah. He does everything where you can watch highlights of him and if I told you he's left-handed, you'd believe it. And if I told you he's right-handed, you'd yeah. believe it, which yeah. is – that is not all that common. Yeah, he's – um, I mean, David Griffin had a great great year. Man, did great, he great ever. Um, did he too, ever. Because it's not just Zion. They got Alexander Walker and Hayes are super, super appealing, interesting prospects that have a chance to be good for a long and time. And no book has been written on Lonzo – or or on uh Brand or new. on Ingram or maybe even Hart like who knows yeah, what Hart Hart's good. ends up being Hart's already a good role player yeah, yeah. so uh it's super uh, super off season for sure and if you're a Pelicans fan you got to be all jacked up about what you are going to see this year the last name we are going to cover is the man who has gotten the most reaction inside of an arena uh, inside of the arena save Zion Williamson um the second most Buzz, cheers, whatever you want to call it, has been for Taco Fall. Taco Fall. Man. Who is playing for the Super Boston Celtics. He's playing for the Boston Celtics Summer League team. And every time he is in the game, every time he gets the ball, every time he dunks or challenges a shot, the crowd is going crazy. Awesome. It is like a he's like a cult hero out here. It it's is hysterical. So <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable to watch, man. Taco Fall, uh, after four years, uh, did not, he was not a good player to start his college career. Ended it solid. And now he's got an opportunity here. Can he be a Boban Marjanovic? That's guy, what it feels yeah, like. You know, like, he can't shoot like Boban, which is the big weakness here. But Taco, like, he's not just a stiff. He can move a little bit. As as a big seven foot six guy, right? I mean, like, does he have a shot, Chris, or is, is he just a summer league star? Does he have a chance? Are you signing Taco Fall as the fifteenth man on your roster? Hell no. Why? <laughs> what? You want to sell some jerseys? He shoots. Get, thir- get kids excited about basketball. I give him. I, hey, I, hey, I, I, I give him a two way so I can draw some people to the games. I mean, look, Kev, he shot thirty percent from the free throw line. <laughs> Like, I mean, uh, there's a guy sitting in, two impossible. seats. Yesterday, I had a guy sitting two seats to my right. And so let me, Taco Falls free throw form. He kind of brings it up <laughs> and he pauses at the top of his release. release it's as if his arm like just freezes. 
a guy sitting to my right is like, is there a Bach in basketball? <laughs> a Bach? A Bach, yeah. Like oh, baseball, yeah, yeah, baseball yeah. Bach, yeah. And, and it's like, oh, maybe there should be. For Taco <laughs> Falls free throw, he, like, he cannot shoot at all. Oh, who was the guy that did that? That paused and they and 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 everybody would cross the line. There's an NBA player for a long, long time that would that would pause when they were about to shoot their free throw, and people I, I, I would. Know, I know Jermaine, would, Jermaine O'Neal did for a while. No, no, no. The, the people would career. jump over the line, like he would. There were there were routinely the uh, the violations that had taken place, but I can't remember uh, who it was that was the guy. It, maybe it was Anthony Mason. That may be right. Um, See if you can look it up. Paused at free throw line because that would be the there. There was a guy that would stop like mid motion, and then people would jump across the line right before uh, or, or right when they were waiting for the guy to shoot. But I can't remember who it was. I mean, you have so had this some, is a little paragraph. I think it was Anthony Mason. Yeah. Rolling Stone wrote, witness one of the oddest examples of free throw form in NBA history. Oh, yes. that's somebody else. That's sorry. I got no, it was I Anthony Mason. Idea. Anthony Mason would like stop. And then you've had, I mean, there was the, there was the one. Yes. There was, there was a Shaq would have that weird, like shot put thing. Chuck Hayes also had a, a really weird one. But anyways, Taco Fall back to him. Kevin. He's also all right, the dude was in college for 15 years. Like, yeah. uh, 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 if he's still shooting free throws at 30%, like, something ain't getting fixed. It's not like he played one year of college. Guy was at, U- he was at Central Florida. I mean, the thing I put up every time that Memphis would play Taco Fall every year, that's a damn Vine. Vine's been gone for, like, half a decade. <laughs> All right, Dude. so Taco Fall's been around forever. Yeah, he has. And, and his but it is great. fun to watch him. Yeah, it, it's awesome to watch him. I, I love watching Taco Fall. And it, by all accounts, yeah. great kid. He's an unbelievable guy from what yes. I've heard. Um, I, I hope he gets an opportunity somewhere in a two-way. Seven-foot, six guy. He, he, Boban, Boban is, the, is the construct for him. Like, to be, yes. become Boban, but Boban is a good shooter. Can you go he's in got a and— He's a mid-range shot. He's, he's great from the free throw line. Taco Fall, anytime he's in the game, you're going to intentionally follow him. Oh, yeah. Line. Yes. And here's the thing. Can you go in for four minutes <laughs> yes. and grab three rebounds and block two shots? Go in for four minutes at the end of a game oh, when yeah. the fan, like it's a blowout and fans are sticking around. Yep. Kids are buying Taco Fall shirts, yep. selling merch, and he's a fan favorite and a fun guy to have in the locker room. And in certain matchups against other bigs, maybe a guy who can be a, a stopper, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, for like eight minutes here and there. Yeah, who that's, knows? That's a, Maybe we'll see him. He's been a joy to watch, though. What a, what a blast, Tiger Fall. Last thing, uh, things we've done in Vegas. We do want to just run through these real quick. Uh, you and I both ate at Momofuku, oh which is God. Dave Chang's restaurant here in so Las Vegas, good. inside the Cosmopolitan. It was outstanding. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that is not that is not one of those. Like, you know, sometimes you go to these restaurants, and they want to make it an experience and they certainly do make it an experience there. Like it is, it's unforgettable. It is. I'll give it, the, I, I, I will certainly give it that. That if you go, you will remember the dining experience that you had there. And it was great. Um, went there. I think the, the, we got, what was your favorite thing on the menu that we got? I would, I think probably the lamb ribs. Yeah, those lamb ribs are awesome. I love the, the pork chop. Yeah. We got the, the, the tasting of the country hams. The ham, oh, the ham was unbelievable. I don't know where he got that country yeah. ham, but it I, was I've, outstanding. I've never had ham. Like, I, hair, yes, it was like, great. Ham is not something I really care for, but that I just couldn't so, It was like a yeah. delicacy. Yes, it was delicious. Uh, there was um, some beef thing, beef yep. too, something like we that. We were so high class. The, the How beef, high class are we? The beef was unbelievable. Just sit around with our pinkies out, eating momofuku. Yeah, yeah, dude, every, no big whoop. It was one of those meals where it's like every single bite. Everything was great. great. Every single bite. Everything was great. Uh, you have seen a couple of shows. You've gotten to see our friend uh, Christian Stoyna, Stoyniev, yeah. who is an NBA halftime performer, big ringer NBA Formally show. on America's Got Talent. Listener. That's he, right. I, I, when people say, who's he? I, I say he's the, the, the muscular shirtless guy with the cute little dog. That's right. Yeah, that's, cre- <laughs> I'm like, oh, I've seen him. I saw him at this game yep. or that game. Or act, I saw him on the show. The act yeah. is Christian and Scooby, yep. and they are part of a show out here called Opium. Which is at the on the second floor of the Cosmopolitan, um, and you were able to go on uh, Sunday night. Yep, and you might be going Thursday, correct? Might be going Thursday night, and it was awesome. Oh, it was awesome! Just, just an awesome, awesome time. Uh, it's I highly recommend going to see Opium. It's at the, the Cosmo, right? Yeah, Cosmo. Yeah, um, it's just a good time. Like ninety minutes of good 
you know. You were like, entertained the whole it, time. It, it's like the talent on stage is unbelievable. Yes. It's like you have Christian doing his balancing yep. uh, with Scooby. Then you have like the guy doing bubbles, like the most amazing bubble show you'll ever see in your life. Really? Um, tap dancing. Yeah. They have, they have a rotating um, set of people that go on stage and perform as well as like a little script and live music as well. Um, which was different than the show that I saw last night. But like with Opium, like they have a live band there playing. Um, and the singer that they have is incredibly talented. Um, just great performances. It's funny, raunchy. Um, don't bring your kids. Uh, <laughs> um, but Opium is great. And um, have you seen Absinthe? Have you seen that yet? I saw that last night. That's the like first year it's made by the same people who the, do, do yes, Opium. The first year I came to Summer League, mm-hmm. I went to Absinthe. And I will tell you, Kevin. It's so good. It was one of the most, I rarely have been more entertained from start to finish than I was when I, I mean, I laughed or was marveling at everything that happened yeah. straight for like 90 minutes. I mean, it had gotten great reviews. I had heard good things about it. It's very politically incorrect. Oh, yeah. It is also <laughs> yeah, very. It is also absolutely hysterical. Yeah. And I, I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was I thought it was funny and I thought the acts were just insane. Like the, the talent that these people have. Unbelievable. And it's stuff that you never see anywhere else. Um, I don't know if they still have it. I, you could tell me because the shows were different. But there was a there was an act, and I believe it's a brother and sister duo that at one point during the show do, they come out on roller skates. Oh yeah, they, the roller skates. They're still there. Closed the the show last night. Yeah, and there is a guy that is spinning around. I'm talking as fast as you can imagine someone spinning on roller skates, and the girl is on his shoulders. The only thing that is attaching her to him is her. Imagine her feet being on his shoulders, like they're like hooked to the back of his shoulders, almost like if you were trying to do a sit up or something. And he is spinning around furiously, and she is. He's not holding on to her with his arms, and she somehow <laughs> staying on. There. And I'm like, bro, if I if he slips at all, she's gonna fly into the crowd and kill somebody. I mean, everything about that show well, was it, insane. The, the, the host uh, did say before they came on, he's like, you know, with a lot of explicit explicitives. Yeah. <laughs> in between, he's like, "Don't stand up, you're gonna get kicked in the face." <laughs> <laughs> During our, our, this next time, it was great, and it's true. Like there are certain times where like he's swinging her, and like her head is like inches from the ground. And they, they were another act that was on America's Got Talent. I, I had seen them before when they first got on stage. I I was like, "Oh, I've seen them before." And that was um, great. yeah, they they were unbelievable. Did, did, at your show, did you see um, the security guards? I don't know. So there's these two security guards, super muscular guys with like yes. a combined one percent body fat. Yes, and they just sort of like <laughs> pick each other up. <laughs> That's what they do. Yeah, they strip down and they. It's a uh, just incredible athletic achievement. Um, there's one point where like I don't know how to describe it exactly, but it's like the guy's head is like leaning on. Like he's so one guy's standing up, yeah, and the other guy is upside down, essentially doing a headstand with his head next to the guy's head, like next to the guy's head, and he's like just sticking straight up in the air. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It, everything, dude. everything about that show <laughs> is ridiculous and unforgettable, to yeah. say the least. And um, very funny, I'm politically incorrect, like you said. Yeah. Fun to yeah. be <laughs> in Las Vegas for this summer league. Also, awesome to get to do the mismatch in person. Which yeah, we we rarely get to do as we are on different parts of the country, uh, but it has been a fun week so far here in Las Vegas, uh, and you can continue to hear about what has happened uh, at theringer.com and also listen to the podcast as they are coming through this week. No doubt, and, and uh, you know, so many people came by our Ringer booth. Yep, and uh, well, they, met a to, ton of fans. Uh, thank you to everybody who said hello. Yep. Um, people were, you know, asked about my family, my dad and everything, you know, it was like super cool. Um, having people, you know, again, share their own stories and all that. Super um, cool. Yeah, just a lot, a lot of fans love the ringer. It's cool. Yep. Um, oh, and I will tell you my favorite one. I'll tell you my favorite one Ooh. of somebody that came yeah. by. So my dear friend, Kristen Ledlow, who everybody knows from NBA TV. I've known Kristen for a very long time. Um, I'm not speaking out of school here. People know she recently got married. Yep. Guy she married is a guy. It's, from, on, it's on social media. Yeah. yeah. Guy, guy, she, guy she married is a guy from Fiji. Right, mm-hmm. that's where he's from. He's yep. Fijian. I 
think is how you say it. Anyway, <laughs> he's no been like a ru- he's like a rugby I'm, I'm, fan, right? He doesn't really care about basketball uh, all that much until he starts going out with her. And obviously that's her job. So he starts watching basketball and he starts getting into it and he starts listening to podcast. And we're his favorite. Wow. Big in Fiji. Big with the big, big with the Fijian population. Yeah. That's amazing. Of all things, a guy that has just gotten into basketball because he likes our chemistry and likes the way that we laugh about stuff and don't take it all too seriously. Um <laughs> and so that was my favorite one. I was so, so proud of that when uh when Kristen told me. Uh that and then awesome. I and then I got to meet him. Yeah. While we, while we were yeah. here, that's great. Because I I, uh, I met <laughs> up with Kristen and uh, and her. You recorded with her, right? I did um, for my local show, yeah. and no, it was super cool to meet him. And for a guy, he's just he's just getting into the yeah. NBA, right? Because his wife works within the NBA. He's like, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna watch her. So he ends up watching the games because being supportive. I, um, I met an executive from a team who <laughs> who said my wife is gonna be happy that I'm meeting you here, and I was like, why? He's like, because she loves your beef with Shay. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. <laughs> she's like, it's her. She's like, he said, yep. she's like, um, it's her favorite thing about the NBA. It's NBA Twitter. There's all the arguing that's and great. all the debating, all the joking, yep. and all the memes. Well, so, yeah, it's, cool. obvi- it's, it's great to see everybody out here. Yeah. That's and the best thing about it. Certainly, thank you to all of you yeah. that came up to Kevin and I uh, throughout yeah, the week in you. Las Vegas. It's going to do it for us from Las Vegas. If you dig what you're hearing, go give us a rating and review on iTunes, and we will talk to you next week. Anyway.